Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, Dr. Bob. Today I'm going to go over a presentation I did about a year ago on addiction. And this is part of my Let's Chat About Things with Dr. Bob series. Now we've already covered diabetes and pain management. Now we're going to get into something that I feel very strongly about and that's addiction. Now, one of the problems that I have with the public attitude towards addiction is that many people seem to think that people that are addicted to substances deserve to suffer because they made bad life choices. That's kind of like saying people that have diabetes deserve to suffer because they didn't choose their diet well. You don't blame somebody for a medical condition that they have, and addiction is a medical condition. So today I want to go over some of the background of addiction medicine and what addiction truly represents. And then in our next episode, we're going to go over some of the treatments that are offered for addiction. So let's cue up the music and join me in a discussion of addiction. To give you a little background on myself, I've been a practicing internal medicine physician since 1996. Well, initially I started off taking care of the chronic diseases of adults, I kind of gravitated towards addiction medicine and pain control. I also do quite a bit of work with alternative medicine. It was always my habit to have a talk with my patients when I diagnosed them with a new condition. I wanted them to understand what was going on and how I planned on approaching it and where they were going from here. I started this series because I don't think doctors are talking with their patients quite as much as the patients would like. And although I'm not taking you on as my patient or suggesting medical care for you, I thought that I would share my patient talk with you so you could gain some understanding of your condition. In addition to the series introduction, this is the third episode, the first being diabetes, the second being chronic pain. And today, as I said, we're going to go over addiction. In future episodes, we may talk about alcoholism and perhaps addiction to benzodiazepines. But in this one, I'd like to concentrate primarily on addiction to opiate pain medicines. Now, those of you that follow the news know that we're in the midst of an opioid crisis. And this is because all narcotic or opioid medications are addictive in any dose if they're taken over time. That's just the nature of their chemistry. Now there's a couple of terms that I think are important. The first one is tolerance. Tolerance, as far as opiates goes, means that you need to take more of the medicine to get the same effect over time. This can in turn lead to dependency, which means that you will get with symptoms of withdrawal if you suddenly stop these medicines. And finally, addiction means that you are actively seeking the medicine to avoid symptoms of withdrawal. This can extend to the point that you do things that you normally would not do, such as steal medicines from other people or obtain them by illegal means. But I think one of the earliest signs of actual addiction is telling little white lies to your provider, exaggerating your symptoms to make sure that you have an ample supply of medication available. Now, one other thing that I want to add to this slide is that most people that are addicted to opiate pain medicines obtain those medicines initially as a form of pain management for an injury or a painful condition. One thing that I always try and stress with my patients is that addiction to pain medicine is not a defect in character, it's pain management gone wrong. That accounts for over 50% of all heroin addicts. Now, the remainder are mostly people that had errors in judgment and tried narcotics for recreational uses and it got away from them. In this video, I would like to go over the two effective treatments for narcotic addiction. You'll notice that simply stopping and going cold turkey is not listed here and that is because it has a very high failure rate. In fact, in my opinion, it's more punishment than effective medical care. The two best approaches, in my opinion, are maintenance therapy with methadone or weaning a patient off of narcotics with or without medical intervention. But we need to keep in mind that any effort to wean a patient off does take time and must be done in a stepwise manner. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are in the midst of an opioid crisis. As you can tell by the graphic, this affects a large number of people. And in fact, in 2015, death from narcotic overdose outstripped automobile accidents as the leading cause of de accidental death in young adults. 
Now, physicians are not blameless in this problem. Back in the 90s, when I was a resident, pain was considered the fourth vital sign. We were told that if you gave narcotics to somebody for pain and they took them for pain, they would not become addicted. And if a patient reported any pain at all, it was considered a hit on our JCO evaluations. The resulting massive increase in narcotic prescriptions being written by doctors started this epidemic. It's come to the point now the states are actually cracking down on it, limiting the amount of prescriptions that can be written. As a result of the excessive number of narcotics written for in the early 90s and the addiction problem, we've actually swung the opposite direction and now it's very difficult to obtain adequate pain control even for people that clearly need it. This has reached almost absurd levels. In fact, when my daughter's cat had bladder stones removed, the veterinarian sent the cat home on Neurontin, which is an anti-seizure medicine rather than actual pain medicine. One good thing that came out of this is the DATA 2000 office-based treatment with buprenorphine. And while this is a very good approach to the problem, it is more of a good intention because actually putting it into place is a little more difficult than you would think it would be. Now let's go over the physiology of opiates and addiction in some detail. Your body has something called mu receptors, which are actually like locks, and the narcotics or the opiates are the keys to those locks. In short, if you take an opiate, it binds to one of these receptors and triggers a response, and that response is to change your perception of the pain to the point that you no longer feel that pain as pain. Those receptors also have some unwanted side effects such as respiratory depression and constipation, but we won't be going over those here. Now your body normally has a certain number of mu receptors in your tissues. As you take narcotics and opiate pain medicines over time, the number of those receptors increases. Now in order to get an effective response from the opiates, you have to have a certain percentage of these receptors triggered. As the number increases, that is the basis for the development of tolerance to narcotics. In other words, you need to take more opiates and narcotics to fill the same relative percentage of receptors if there are more receptors in your body. And finally, if your receptors are used to being filled with the narcotic because you're taking one chronically, if those receptors are empty, they are unhappy. You will start to have cravings for the medication, and then if you don't get it, you will actually have symptoms of withdrawal. Now, while there are several medical approaches to addiction, I'd like to go over two of them in particular that have some good data behind them. The first is what we call replacement or maintenance therapy with a narcotic, such as methadone. Your body requires the narcotic, so rather than have you go out on the street and obtain it, you can go to a clinic on a daily basis to get a supervised dose of methadone that will stop the withdrawal. Now, two things. A taper with this is possible, even though it's called maintenance therapy. They can gradually reduce your dose over time, although most just keep you on a steady dose. The other problem is that by law, you have to have a supervised dose on a daily basis for a period of time. With good compliance, you can earn the right to have take-home doses for up to a week at a time, but it requires an awful lot of going to the clinic. Methadone clinics are required to have special licensing. You have certain staffing requirements that are made, and you have to have medicine on site. A second approach is what they call a Data 2000 waiver, which is an office-based treatment system that any physician can have. It involves a weak opiate called buprenorphine, which fills the mu receptors but does not elicit an effect. When used properly, it stops the cravings but does not produce the euphoria, allowing you to wean off with careful management. This does require special training, which lasts about eight hours, and a special license from the Drug Enforcement Agency. Patients can fill their prescription for up to a 30-day supply at a local pharmacy and continue on with their daily lives. In both methadone maintenance and buprenorphine treatment, supportive counseling to treat the root of the addiction is suggested. Unfortunately, there is a tremendous stigma with addiction to narcotics. 
In fact, you can even see YouTube videos mocking people that are addicted to narcotics. Let's go over a couple of these. First of all is the, well, just quit. You chose to start, you can choose to stop. This fails to take into account that narcotic addiction is a physical change to both your body with the number of mu receptors and your thinking processes. Trying to simply quit just forces people into withdrawal and makes them suffer and then they relapse and fail. The second is it's their own fault. It's a mental weakness. It's a lack of moral character on their part and they deserve to suffer. Most people are hypocrites because what they'll do is they'll say it's their own fault and then not mention the fact that as a result they should suffer. They want the personal satisfaction of feeling superior and causing other people to suffer without just overtly saying it. Now another criticism that's pretty common and kind of tough to get over is trading one addiction for another. While this has some justification, in reality what we're doing is we're trading uncontrolled behavior for controlled behavior. We're also getting the patients into recovery counseling and reducing the number of overdose deaths. Now another problem that is just a symptom of society is that drug addicts are not like us. That means that they're darker than we are and poorer than we are. Having treated addiction for a number of years now, I can assure you that the people that are addicted to narcotics are the people sitting next to you in church, standing next to you in the line at the pharmacy, or working for you. They are your friends, your neighbors, and sometimes your family members, and perhaps even yourself. They are exactly like you, and in fact, maybe you. And if it hasn't touched your life personally, it may in the near future. Finally, we have a perception that treatment doesn't work. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have very effective treatments for addiction now. Well, thank you very much for stopping by. Today we covered some of the basis of addiction, and in our next episode, we'll talk about the treatments. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by, and make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there. Take care and stay safe.